Okay, today we are going to do the second part of our biomes. We're going to be looking at aquatic biomes, and then we are going to go over conservation. Okay, starting with our aquatic biomes, we have four different types. There are wetlands, lakes, the coastal regions, and the oceans themselves. So aquatic biomes um, can contain either salt water or fresh water or what we call brackish water. And brackish water is just a mixture of the fresh and the salt combined. Um, unlike terrestrial biomes, however, all water biomes are connected. So if you remember the water cycle from when you studied it in high school, um, that means that every water biome is connected to another. And that's not true of our terrestrial biomes. So let's start with the wetlands. <clears throat> and wetlands are kind of further subdivided into marshes, swamps, and bogs. And the wetlands are really significant because they purify the water um, by removing toxins based on the type of soil that's present and, of course, also the plants. They filter out um, <clears throat> any toxins. And so that they play a crucial role just for the whole earth because, as we said, um, all of the water systems are connected. So without these wetlands, then we would have a buildup of toxins in the water supply. Okay, so our marshes <clears throat> are um, pretty much frequently inundated with water. So they keep they keep a, at least a small amount of water in them. And they are signified by the grasses that are present. So this picture right here is actually off the coast of North Carolina, the marsh over there, <coughs> excuse me, in Swansboro. And you can see these kayakers are kind of paddling in between. The tide has probably come in, so it keeps it wet. And um, lots of animals depend on these grasses, various types of marsh birds, as well as some um, specific type of oysters are all dependent on this particular marsh section. So when we talked about <clears throat> how the various wetlands remove toxins, um, a lot of times you'll see that you can't pull oysters from certain areas, and that's because they're one of the organisms that causes um, that toxin to be removed because it gets filtered out by our filter feeders as well as these grasses. So they're doing us a great service, but we want to make sure we don't eat them as well. Okay, so another type of wetland is swamps, and many of you are familiar with that. Um, unlike the marshes that are dominated by grasses, swamps are dominated by woody plants, actually, or woody shrubs. And so um, an example of that is the Everglades in South Florida. And so you can see all these cypress trees here. They are woody trees, and they are home to the American alligator. Um, something that's interesting about Florida, uh, I have pictures or slides actually of my granddad um, when he went to do some excavation of dinosaur bones in South Florida and so he's standing next to these enormous dinosaur bones and he went down there before they drained the swamp to build the metropolis of Miami and Fort Lauderdale so if you've ever been to Miami or Fort Lauderdale you know they're enormous enormous cities but they were all built where there used to be natural swampland. So a significant part of Florida used to be covered in swamps, but it's been drained and filled in and built on top of. Okay, our third type of wetland is a bog. And that's, we've seen this before. We usually see it in higher climates. Um, they have acidic water in them and <clears throat> they have a lot of peat and sphagnum moss. When we talked about the plants, we talked about that a lot in Canada, for instance. Um, so just very acidic, um, some uh, slower decomposition, and as you can tell, this is not dominated by woody trees like the swamps. So that is our third type of wetland. Okay, our second type of aquatic biome is lakes, and y'all are familiar with that. Those are bodies of fresh water, and there are two types. There's an oligotrophic lake, and that means it's nutrient poor, and those are usually seen at higher altitudes. So think about 
lakes that we would have seen, say, in Rocky Mountain National Park. Remember when we talked about that and there were <clears throat> our terrestrial biomes such as tundra um, or um, alpine forest, the coniferous forest. And if you remember when we talked about that, the soil was fairly nutrient poor. So it's that same soil, so the lakes are nutrient poor as well. And then the other type of lake is a eutrophic, and so just the opposite, it is a nutrient rich lake. And that's what we have around here in our um, temperate deciduous forests, they have lakes that are high in nutrients as well. As you can tell in this picture, you have to be careful how high those nutrients get because then you can have algae blooms and things like that. Okay, let's talk about lake turnover. And <clears throat> this occurs um, in every lake, but um, it is a mixing of the water and nutrients and the oxygen throughout the water column. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, so if you think about a typical lake, let's talk about like maybe Jordan Lake around here, there is a stratification that occurs in the summer due to the solar heat. So that top layer, if you've ever jumped in a lake, you know those top six inches are nice and warm and everything else underneath it is chilly. Um, and that top layer increases in oxygen because of all the photosynthetic <clears throat> um, organisms that live at that top layer. So in the summer, that top layer is oxygen rich and the bottom layer increases in nutrients because as those um, organisms start to die and sink to the bottom, they decompose and the decomposers um, <clears throat> use up that oxygen. And so the oxygen at the bottom is lower in the summer. So if you look at our picture here, I'm trying to get my pen. Um, so here's our strummer, summer stratification and our oxygen at the top is high and our oxygen down here is going to be low. Okay, in the fall, as temperatures drop and that top layer starts to cool, there's a lot of wind in the fall and that creates a mixing of the layers until the water temperatures are uniform from top to bottom. So here we are, that fall turnover. And what that results in is a uniform um, temperature gradient. So we no longer have that stratification that we had in the summer. In the winter, at least slightly north of here, ice forms and that acts as an insulator. Okay, so here's that insulating layer. And <clears throat> that keeps those temperatures uniform still. In the spring, when temperatures start to rise, the ice melts and that cooler water again sinks to the bottom. And then of course also in the um, spring we have a significant amount of wind. So our cold water sinks and our warm, air, warm water rises. And then we're back to summer with um, intense sun and the stratification again. So all species have ways that they deal with this lake turnover and the different conditions. So <clears throat> this is just an excerpt about um, largemouth bass uh, as lake turnover occurs. And so as temperatures decrease in the water, um, the bass have metabolism that slows down and they don't do much movement. And so what that means for fishermen, for instance, that in those winter months, they have a whole lot more water column to search because if you'll remember the water column um, those temperatures are pretty uniform throughout but they are cooler than they are in the summer and because the metabolism is slow fishermen have to have a slow approach and usually something um, that makes noise or is pretty flashy because if the fish are going to expend energy they need to know for sure that they're going to get something in return so um, so based on what the temperature range is, fishermen have to approach the fish differently. Okay, that was lakes. Now we're gonna move on to our coastal region, our coastal biomes. And um, there are a couple of things we wanna look at. We wanna look at estuaries, and then we wanna look at intertidal zones.
Estuaries have that brackish water that we talked about. That's a mixture of salt and fresh water. So it's really where the ocean meets the fresh water from the rivers that dump into the oceans. So these include like mangrove swamps, some marshes, um, mud flats, and lagoons. And these are significant. This is the nurseries of the ocean. Two thirds of fish and, and shellfish spawn in these areas. They are super high in biodiversity, in nutrients, and in productivity. So these are the areas that we tend to try to protect the most. So when you did your um, reading of <clears throat> the dinoflagellates, and we talked about how they affected the Pamlico Sound and the estuaries there, that's why that was so significant. Because when you have something that is um, diminishing the health of an estuary, it has long reaching effects because the biodiversity of the oceans are affected by the health of the estuaries because that's where most of these fish come to spawn. Okay, the intertidal zone is exactly what it sounds like. That's the area between high tide and low tide mark. And there are really kind of two different types. There's the rocky shoreline and the sandy shoreline. So rocky shoreline sort of is, for instance, off the coast of San Diego, where you have cliffs that meet the ocean and they're very rocky. And so those shorelines offer substrate for organisms to attach to. So this is where you're gonna see lots of clams and um, that sort of thing, um, lots of barnacles, that kind of thing. The sandy shoreline, like we have here on the East Coast, um, well, particularly of North Carolina, has shifting sand. So most animals that live there are burrowing animals. So you all know that because there are all these little holes when you go to the beach. And <clears throat> they meet maybe little mussels that are buried or they could be a particular type of crustacean. And um, most of them are going to be filter feeders that stick out um, their mouths usually when the water comes in and then puts them right back down when they go out. But the organisms that live here uh, have to be highly adaptable. They have to be able to live completely submerged and they also have to be able to live completely in air. So when you look at these organisms, part of it to me is that you just kind of marvel at the ability to live in both of those conditions because we certainly can't do that. Um, and one of the things I just wanted to mention is a lot of times the intertidal zone, particularly on the sandy um, shores, have a lot of grasses. And that's to make sure that the sand doesn't shift and wash away all the time. So it's pretty significant that we have those types of uh, sea grasses. And oftentimes, like you'll see it in the dunes, that, that, um, and that's just to keep that sand from shifting. Okay, so what's left? We have the oceans. So oceans cover 70% of the Earth's surface and 90% of our water is found in the ocean. So we have five named oceans, really. That's the Arctic, the Atlantic, the Indian, the Southern, and the Pacific. You might have remembered learning that um, sometime in geography. Um, so it's pretty crucial that since 70% of the Earth is covered in the ocean, that we might want to have a little bit of knowledge about it. So if you'll remember before when we talked about the oceans, because we did mention the deep ocean before, um, the ocean um, as a biome itself is quite large, obviously, but it does get break, broken down into different areas. Um, the epipelagic, which is a portion that we are most familiar with, and that's where most of the fish that we know about live. The uh, phytoplankton are there. Most of our ocean mammals live there, <clears throat> sharks. And then we um, step down into the mesopelagic. And then we step down even further. And then we start coming down to the abyssal zone, which we've talked about before. And then anytime you're along the bottom, we call that the benthic area, okay? Let's see if I can write that decently. Okay, so <clears throat> if you haven't noticed, our biomes that are aquatic tend to not be so much based on the plants that are present. 
In the ocean, the amount of plants compared to the volume of water is not very many. So then we start dividing our biomes based on salinity and temperature, <clears throat> um, and then also the organisms that are present. The interesting thing about the oceans is that most of it still remains unexplored. So I'm a huge NASA fan, so super excited about space that hasn't been explored yet, but we also have a tremendous amount to still learn about our own planet and the oceans that are there as most of it has been left um, unexplored. So that was kind of a quick overview of our aquatic biomes. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about conservation, mo mostly in general terms. So what I mean by conservation is the preservation, protection, and restoration of the natural environment <clears throat> its ecosystems, including the vegetation and the wildlife present there as well. That's what we generally mean in terms of conservation. So what are we conserving? <clears throat> in the past, our efforts have been on conserving specific animals. So for instance, <clears throat> often we would Kind of pick favorite type of animals to be um, conserved or protected. So I grew up in the 80s and this was very popular, the Save the Whales campaign. Um, and so you could actually quote adopt a whale unquote and money would go to conservation efforts. So the whale populations had decreased mostly due to over harvesting. So efforts were made mostly in the form of legislation, we'll talk about that, uh, to regulate how many whales, if any, people could take. Um, but as an 80s kid, um, we were all about saving the whales. I think I even adopted one myself, um, you know, and so you'd get this picture of the whale and what it looked like and you felt very significant. Um, so, so in the past, if an animal was cute and people liked it enough, we were wanting to protect it. Now, most of our conservation efforts are based on biodiversity. And um, so we talked before about species diversity and species richness. Um, <clears throat> and when we're looking at conservation efforts, we're looking at three different types of biodiversity. The first is genetic diversity, um, the genetic variation among the members of a population. So like high genetic diversity would mean that um, when a population is pressured, it has enough uh, genetic diversity to allow for it to be adaptable. Um, the second is community diversity. So how many species are within <clears throat> a community? This is what we were talking about with species diversity. And third is landscape diversity. And that means um, when you are looking, let's say for instance, at a terrestrial biome, um, when we have grasslands next to, let's say, a um, temperate deciduous forest, um, it's important that we have long tracts of land that allow for continuity between the different ecosystems and not having fragmentation between them. Okay, so efforts to maintain biodiversity are usually focused on the human impact and um, trying to lessen that as much as possible. So when we look at biodiversity and we wanna look at what causes the decrease in bio biodiversity or the extinction even of various organisms, they mostly fall into these various categories. Habitat loss, uh, invasive species, pollution, climate change, and over um, exploitation. Now, <clears throat> climate change and pollution could also be categorized into habit, habitat loss, but we're just gonna briefly look at them separately. Okay, so habitat loss. This can occur in a number of different ways, both human-induced and by natural occurrences. Um, one of the best examples that we have is grasslands being converted to farmland. So open prairies where we used to have large roaming grazing mammals, um, that were converted into farmland means a loss of habitat for those natural grasses and then therefore also for those large grazing mammals. Um, 
<clears throat> when we talk about conservation though, we do have to remember to keep things in balance because idealistically people look at it and think, oh, well, we need to stop having farmlands being taken over and we want everything to look as if humans had never touched it. But we are also a significant species and we do need to be fed. So there is a balance that must be maintained. Um, another example of habitat loss is the conversion of tropical rainforests to farmland. And <clears throat> we talked before that there are, um, that the tropical rainforest is particularly important because it's what we call a biodiversity hotspot, which means an area of large concentrations of species, meaning, ah, maybe large concentration isn't the right word, uh, a large variety of species. So super high biodiversity, all concentrated into one area. That's called a biodiversity hotspot. And so most people get upset when biodiverse, bleh, sorry, biodiversity hotspots are converted for human purposes. So this picture right here is what we call slash and burn. Um, that means that these, the tropical rainforest was literally just cut down and everything burned. Um, <clears throat> When appropriate farming techniques are used, a, a good balance can be achieved. So um, we are still learning what the good um, farming techniques are, and we certainly have to try to maintain um, that, uh, what was I trying to say, the, the diversity that allows for lots and lots of land. We don't want fragmentation. <clears throat> so that's important for when we're looking at tropical rainforests. Invasive species. Boy, kudzu is the best example there. Um, it's called the vine that ate the south. I love that term. Um, this picture is actually um, right up near the Nantahala Outdoor Center near Bryson City, North Carolina. That area is completely covered in kudzu. So invasive species are basically species that are introduced in an area and they have no natural predator, and so they take over an ecosystem. And typically speaking, they're introduced for very good reasons. So kudzu was a plant that was introduced to the U.S. from Japan. Um, <clears throat> it came in 1876 at the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. Um, and so and then later it was introduced in the Southeast in 1883 at the New Orleans Expo Exposition. And when they first brought it over, um, they marketed it um, as an ornamental plant to be used to shade porches. Um, and this was in like the first half of the 20th century, kudzu was distributed as like high protein content for cattle fodder and um, a cover plant to prevent soil erosion. Because remember, when we had the dust bowl, we learned soil erosion was extremely bad. So. Um, it was cultivated by the Civilian Conservation Corps workers as a solution for the erosion during the Dust Bowl. So like I said, oftentimes invasive species are brought um, to a location with great intentions, and kudzu is the perfect example. Um, because as it doesn't have a natural predator, it continues to grow and it basically suffocates anything else um, that was trying to grow underneath it. Okay, let's talk about pollution for a minute. <clears throat> pollution is any contaminant introduced in the environment that adversely affects the lives and the health of the living organisms in that area. Um, it can be a naturally um, occurring chemical, but it, it's higher concentrations than usual, um, or it can be something that is introduced that wasn't present there already. So this picture here is Los Angeles in 1948. And, um, Los Angeles had such a problem with pollution. So since the 1950s were the height of the smog epidemic in LA, um, there's lots of personal testimonies to people's eyes that just burned on a regular basis. And the cause of this smog was because there was so um, much fuel being burned in such a small concentrated area. So diesel fuels were used for transportation, for construction, for manufacturing, um, and it was all burned in such a tight space that didn't have any um, air circulation or anything like that. I love this picture. This is Miss Smogfighter in 1951. 
Um, it really is just, I don't know, it's just so cute because it's the 50s and with her um, looking at this bottle of smog and you can just picture her going, oh, you know, anyway. Um, but this was one of the ways that they started campaigns against the smog. So what helped that smog to go away? It was a series of legislations to clean up the air. So in 1955, we had the Air Pollution Control Act. Um, in 1963, we had the Clean Air Act. 1967 was Air Quality Act. Um, by 1970, there were um, uh, national ambient air quality standards that were <clears throat> put into place. So if you look at the first three, often that was um, legislation that basically funded research. By the time we get to the 70s, um, that research has been done, or at least a significant portion of it has been done, and um, that information is used then to create standards that must be maintained. And then in 77, there were a couple of amendments to that Clean Air Act, um, and then in 1990, a few more. <clears throat> and so, um, my, my, my point in this is to say that once you identify the problem, then you have to research the problem, which takes money, and then it also takes time. And as you can see from the 50s to about the 90s, so that's about 40 years worth of a process to clean up the air in LA. And so now the, clairs, the air is not so bad in LA, you can breathe. Um, it still has a couple days um, where it's not great, but it's far better than the 1950s. So um, legislation helped to clean the air, but it does take time. Okay, climate change. <clears throat> We've talked about that that can um, produce a loss of habitat. Um, if we have organisms that are living in a very cold environment, and remember we talked about how there is a specific temperature range that certain organisms can live in. So if our um, climate change means that we have warmer conditions, then some of those organisms are either going to have to move or they might die out. Climate change is definitely the hot topic of the day. Um, there's a lot of debate. Um, I think there's not a lot of debate on are we currently in a cycle of global warming? Um, yes, I think we are. Uh, the debate more comes in to whether that is uh, human induced or not. So what I have here is um, the data from various places, uh, the Japanese Meteorological Agency, all the way to NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, and of course NOAA. <clears throat> and so recorded temperatures date back to the 1880s. And since the 1920s, there has been a warming trend, and you can see that um, about right here. Starts to be a little more significant in the 80s. Um, so what has caused this warming trend? What does it really mean? Um, over the whole history of the Earth, um, and if you look at macroevolution, then you're talking billions of years, um, then 140 years of data doesn't really seem like a long enough time period to observe um, a real trend for prediction purposes. So <clears throat> right now there's... Um, a lot of anxiety be about um, global warming and its significance. And um, the problem, I think, is that the media gets a hold of it and makes that anxiety worse. Um, but the question is, um, is it human induced? Is it even something we need to worry about? Because there are going to be natural fluctuations. If you look at National Geographic back in the 50s, I believe it is, they thought the world was coming to a new ice age. They saw significant decreases that I'm going to guess that that probably happened about here. And so they worried that everything was going to freeze. So some things to think about um, are um, what about the ice ages and the melting periods that happened after them? Humans didn't cause those because we weren't really around then. Um, so I personally think I don't think that we can honestly say we can change the global climate um, when we can't even predict the weather accurately. Um, 
But what I do think is that we need to be responsible with our resources, including the air we breathe and the ozone. Um, and so a lot of times when we talk about climate change and the possibility of warming, um, those that argue that people are causing the climate change um, are talking mostly about pollution. Oftentimes they talk about fossil fuels and things like that. And those are things I think we do, we do need to be responsible for and we do need to make sure that we are taking care of. Now, <clears throat> now that you know my views on it, because I think people get up in arms over something that I don't think we have enough information to predict. Um, that's my take on it. You're welcome to agree or disagree, um, but definitely know the facts and definitely don't get your information from uh, just regular media. Okay, overexploitation. Basically what that means is taking too many individuals from a wild population then can naturally be replaced. So the image on the right is a whaling station um, and whaling was a common practice and uh, produced meat and oil in large quantities um, and those fed people and kept them warm. It was not a pretty job. Uh, this is in black and white so you can't see a lot but that is a lot of blood. If you've ever seen any uh, footage from uh, whale processing plants, it is a very bloody stinky job. Um, it means hunting in the cold, treacherous seas, and like I said, whale processing is just bleh. So by the early 1900s, as whaling became more efficient <clears throat> and, and became more of a commercial industry, the whale population began to decline worldwide. So much so that many species were on the verge of extinction or did actually go extinct. So again, legislation um, is what helped to protect those whales. So the first two here, the Marine Mammals Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act, those affected whales in the US. But the thing is, um, whales are a worldwide population because they roam um, all over the world through lots of different seas. So the Pelly Amendment in 1971 um, basically affected commerce with other nations to impose um, important sanctions. So if you look, I have it in yellow, uh, directs commerce to impose import sanctions on the fish products of nations that have violated any international fisheries conservation programs, such as the International Whaling Convention. And so um, those sanctions were meant to make sure that safe whaling and fisheries practices were used not only by the US, but worldwide. So here are some more international laws. Um, and in 18, uh, sorry, 1986, um, they instituted an indefinite ban on commercial whaling totally. So this, the ban is still in effect as a, a few certain exceptions. Um, countries such as Japan and Norway have not honored that ban. Um, that is such a part of their cultural heritage. Um, but it seems to be that um, over time that's starting to decline anyway as a cultural value. And with only really two countries being whalers, uh, the population was able to rebound. So this was just something I thought was interesting. This is looking at uh, the Southern Hemisphere, but um, the catch of great whales. And so if you look at the amount of catch on the left, in other words, the number of whales that were harvested, um, so that is that excess right there, and over time. <clears throat> so what we see is between 1914 and 1918, um, there's not a whole lot of whales being harvested. Do you know what occurred during that time? World War One. Okay, we don't have time to be whaling when we are fighting. After World War One, whaling increased. And then here we go. You know what happened in this time frame? World War Two. Okay, and so again. When the whole world is at war, we don't have time to whale. Not to mention at this point, now we have submarines that are um, roaming those same waters and you don't want to be in them. So then after World War II, 
then there is an increase again in whaling and kind of levels off. And then we start to see the legislation come into play and there's a decrease in whales that are harvested. So we've talked about a bunch of different ways that can cause damage to various populations, including even leading to extinction. So let's talk about our conservation techniques. We've already talked about some, such as correcting the overexploitation of whales or the pollution reduction in LA through legislation. So we know legislation is a big way that those things happen. Um, two of the other things that we're gonna look at are habitat preservation and or restoration and keystone species protection. So <clears throat> let's look at an example um, where we reintroduced wolves to Yellowstone National Park. So these wolves were, um, are pretty much keystone species. Now, what is the significance of them? How, what's their story? Um, <clears throat> So this has been about a 25 year experiment in ecosystem management. A lot has been learned and a lot has been left unknown. So what we're gonna start with is the 1920s. In the 1920s, there was, were management efforts um, to control this predator population of the gray wolves in, Yellow, in the Yellowstone area. And the reason for this is because <clears throat> They, well, the main reason it started probably was because the farmers that were right next to Yellowstone constantly had wolves taking out their cattle population. And when there's a significant amount of wolves, what they often do is they get in packs, they will kill a cow, for instance, and then not even eat it. So farmers are losing cattle um, by the hundreds to wolves that aren't even eating it. So it's just a loss for no reason. So in 1920s, <clears throat> there was um, an effort to basically control the gray wolves and that actually led to the um, near extinction of them in that area. <clears throat> then when, they're, when they were gone, once you have that keystone species out of the picture that led to a, a boom in elk population. So there's like a domino effect that happens. So no more gray wolves, so no more top predator. Elk population increases, and then there's a decrease in vegetation due to the grazing from these elk. So <laughs> once we have the decrease in um, vegetation, then we have a decrease in songbird population. Beavers lose their uh, lumber for building dams. And when they do that, then there's an erosion of stream beds that occurs, and those stream beds were important for the population of willows. So <laughs> when we took out that keystone species, there was a domino effect that changed the entire ecosystem. So in 1995, um, people thought, you know what, we need to reintroduce these gray wolves to Yellowstone. So there was a whole project, and I actually um, was finishing up college at this point in time, and I remember the big debates as to whether this was a good idea or not, um, and it landed on the side of, yes, we're going to do this. So gray wolves were reintroduced. <clears throat> it took a little while for their populations to increase, but they did, and then there was a thinning of the elk population. So the vegetation increased. There was a slight increase in beaver population and songbar population. However, the stream ecology had changed so significantly and affected the willow populations um, and they just never returned. Additionally, while those gray wolves were gone, there was an increase in other carnivorous populations like the grizzly bears. So <clears throat> even though we reintroduced the gray wolves, the same ecosystem did not emerge again because other things had changed so much. So the question remains open. Um, was it a good idea to take out the gray wolves? Was it a good idea to reintroduce them? One thing I like about this story is it makes you think, what type of environment are you conserving? And why is one particular type of ecosystem more important than the other? <clears throat>
and what are what is your end goal I think one lesson that was learned um, that is more important than any other is that it is easier to protect an ecosystem than to try to restore it it's very hard to um, remake something that has been lost so another example that I want to talk about is white-tailed deer management by the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission this is population control basically <clears throat> so why do we do it to start with so overpopulation in white-tailed deer leads to herd illness so lots of disease um, and then a decrease in available resources so um, so that leads again to sick deer and then of course car interactions um, we do have a significant amount of collisions with cars when the population is very high so when you're taking a test for a hunting license in North Carolina hunters learn uh, the limits in other words how many deer they can take what age what areas they can hunt so what's interesting <clears throat> so I grew up you know in South Florida and then in Georgia and when I was in, in Georgia and this will probably tell you my age um, all of my guy friends came to school with a gun rack in the back of their truck because they had probably been deer hunting that morning before they came to school it's something that everybody in South Georgia does so interesting thing is here in the triangle there aren't that many hunters so <clears throat> our way of controlling the population can't just be limited to giving out hunting licenses with numbers that they can take so something I learned that was very interesting is that at least in this area sometimes birth control injections are used to maintain um, a limit on the population of the white-tailed deer and <clears throat> to be honest I think that the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission does a pretty good job they're really great about um, keeping tabs on the various herds how many are still present the health of them um, they're constantly monitoring it so this is something I where I think um, the methods of conservation have done a good job okay this is gonna be my warning when it comes to conservation and yes this is my soapbox and I will be standing on it um, I want you to always be thinking beware of alarmist speech especially without scientific support so <clears throat> This is actually a paragraph from your textbook and it about made me crazy when I read it so let's just read it real quickly and then I'm going to tear it apart <laughs> conservation biology has emerged in response to the extinction crisis the earth is experiencing now what is an extinction crisis because using those words right there is so alarmist and says oh my gosh there's an issue there's a problem population sizes will always ebb and flow with or without human interaction so we have to be responsible for the way that we interact with animals how many animals we take out of an ecosystem but we also cannot control everything okay I'm gonna stop right there estimates vary but at least 10 to 20 percent of all species now living most likely will become extinct in the next 20 to 50 years okay I'm gonna stop there for a minute predicting destruction with a will likely is not a scientific way of saying something how do you put numbers like 10 and 20 percent and will likely in the same sentence along with specific numbers 20 to 50 years to me that is crazy <laughs> first of all we don't even know all the species that exist so to say 10 to 20 percent of all of them seems a little inaccurate and remember how many times we've mentioned the areas that we haven't even explored deep sea glacial lakes um, I, I just don't get that okay let's move on so that's how many are going to be extinct unless planned coordinated actions are taken so how can we assume that people have the knowledge to keep ecosystems from falling apart if that were the case how did they survive without us it just seems very arrogant to say that 
all of these species are going to go away unless we have some planned coordinated efforts. We can't even control all the factors. <clears throat> okay, moving on. It is urgent that all citizens understand the concept and importance of biodiversity, the causes of present day extinctions, how to prevent future extinctions from occurring, and the potential consequences of decreased biodiversity. Whew, okay. I'm not saying that species aren't endangered or that people shouldn't be mindful and responsible about handling the Earth's resources. Of course not. I totally think that we need to be good stewards of this Earth and all the resources that we have. The only thing I'm saying is that we need to settle down a bit, be aware of our own lack of knowledge for, in, for starters, and learn to be good stewards. I am cognizant of our greedy nature, including with our resources, and that that has to be reined in. I do get that. I just want us, when we are reading things about the environment, to not think in such an alarmist way. And yes, I did put this little question um, at the bottom <laughs> that just says, in addition to all of that, preserving what stage of succession is considered conservation? So those are some things to think about. And the interesting thing is, while I'm telling you this, I know I sound like such a pessimist, um, I actually am a huge fan <laughs> of wildlife conservation. Um, I just don't like when people um, blow it out of proportion and act like it's something that we have total control over. What we can control is our own individual actions and how we interact with the environment. And we're actually going to talk a little bit about that in a very short lecture next time um, entitled Leave No Trace and the principles that we work with um, on an individual basis. But that is it for today.